two images, or rather an image and a phrase that have stayed with me since my youth that captures some of the, the dangers, the joys, the risks, the anxieties of beginning the journey of change. Uh, one from Frank Herbert, he says the beginning is a very delicate time. This is the other image, it's from Jack and the Beanstalk. And this is Jack about to begin his journey. So he's planted the beans and he's climbed the beanstalk and he's arrived in the new world. And he doesn't know what he's in for. And until he knows what he's in for, until he's in some way completed the journey, he also doesn't know what it's been like. Because when we're in the middle of change, we don't have that ability to know what change is like. And uh, there's a phrase we'll come back to later, but he's no longer what he was, and he's not yet what he's going to be. So there's something about change, that transition, where identity, where the fixed points are all a bit more fluid, and that's quite discombobulating. The movies are very good at this. This is one version of the screenwriting structure. So at the beginning of the movie, you've got Act One, the small world of established habit, of established routine, and the world that is going to be disrupted, whether it's by the meteor in the Bruce Willis movie or by the tragedy in the art house grief fest. Something is going to come along to disrupt your established world. And that's what we want to see. We want to see characters struggle with change. We want to see what that journey of change looks like. And it's only when we get to the end of that transitional period, and I think this is what Hegel is getting at in this quote, uh, the owl of Minerva flies only with the coming of twilight. Wisdom only comes at the end of a season. We only quite know what we've been through once we've been through it. Be that a holiday, so the, what's the first question that someone will ask you about today or your holiday or a movie? What was it like? And it's only once you get to the end of that process you begin to speak about it, you begin to incorporate it into your normal routine. You make it like something. You get back to a kind of new normal. So unlike the movies, our lives tend to be a bit more stable. The, the season's gone for a little longer and the transitions tend to be a little less steep, a little less dramatic. Uh, and we, for long seasons, uh, I think seasons is quite a, a nice way to think about it, we live under a rule and a rhythm of life, that's a term borrowed from the monastic communities, where things tend to be fairly predictable in our lives. Uh, and this is what, where I wanted to begin, is to look at some of the elements that make up our seasons, our small worlds, the, the people, places and things of Act One before change begins. So, let's talk about place and the rooms and the places we do our work in. I think when we think about habit and when we think about thinking and when we think about identity, we tend to be quite idiocentric. We tend to lo locate those things within ourselves, whereas certain branches of psychology, sociology are beginning to wake up to the fact that our, our identity, our thinking, our habits, our way of being, they're embedded, they're extended, they're embodied uh, within our environment. So if you think about me writing this book, leading up uh, to beginning it, there was a long period of filling notebooks. I walked about with a little dictaphone for a long time. I then uh, transcribed all of that stuff, I indexed it wrote it into filing cards, set up a filing cabinet that the filing cards referred to, then made a map of all the chapters of all three books, which makes me sound incredibly OCD. I'm not. This is very unusual behaviour for me. Uh, but I wasn't being overly organised. I was using cognitive prosthetics, because once I got a room in which that thinking was embodied, I didn't need to think so much. It was externalised, so I could now interact with those cognitive cognitive prosthetics and it's what uh, Richard Menery, uh, a quote from him, the construction of cognitive tools and artefacts in the cognitive niche scaffold and support human cognition which is a more technical way of capturing what I think Daphne du Maurier captured really beautifully in, uh, in Rebecca. So I'm presuming most of you know the, the basic story of Rebecca which is the new Mrs. de Winter moves into this palatial country estate where the deceased Rebecca used to preside and very much this dead ex-wife of her new husband of Mrs. De Winter's new husband Rebecca, she still presides over Manderley and it's in some ways it's almost like a ghost story because as the, uh, the new Mrs. De Winter says Rebecca is in the house still but it's quite unusual, this story or indeed unique and it's a secular haunting so Rebecca's not there as a persecutory spirit She's there as a rule and a rhythm of life. So everything that happens in Manderley, everything that happens in this house, has been pre-prescribed. So 
The servants obey her orders still. The food we ate in the room was the food she liked. Her favourite flowers filled the room. Not only that, but uh, the walks that they take at certain times of day, when guests are met, where guests are met, when letters are opened, all the rules and the rhythms are prescribed by Rebecca, and they still encode, they still embody Rebecca. And as difficult as that makes it for the new Mrs. De Winter, think how easy that would have made life for Rebecca. She's offloaded all this thinking into her environment and into the people around her. And effectively, we're all Rebecca's of our own Manderleys. We're, we all live in rooms haunted by ourselves and they massively facilitate our everyday being. Uh, let's think about the people that we meet in those rooms, people we encounter. One of the things I really liked about the first season of uh, Mad Men was the fact that uh, Don Draper was shown to be a member of various different worlds, all of which he tried to keep apart. So he was one thing in the advertising community. He was a, another Don Draper. He was a square to the Bohemians. He was kingpin to the advertising community. He was uh, one kind of guy with his wife, another kind of guy with his mistress. So he was shown to be the kind of the, the focal point of this series of small worlds which didn't interconnect apart from with him. And we get a similar idea from Italo Calvino in Invisible Cities where he talks about one of the cities, one of his imaginary cities, where the inhabitants stretch strings from the corner of the houses, white or black, or grey or black and white, according to whether they mark a relationship of blood, of trade, authority or agency. And if you think about the different kinds of relationships that we say have with colleagues, with neighbours, with families, and a different kind of you that we are with those people, normally those worlds don't collide unless you get married or die. And this... And this is something that the, the addictions uh, researchers get really well, is that sometimes to change our habits, we not only need to change our habits internally and leave the place, we also need to leave the people. We need to do a geographical and get away from the people that our habits are embodied in. Finally, the, the last element of our small world that I'm going to talk about is the thinking of habit probably the way we're more used to thinking about it. The, the, this is a desire line, the, the, the past that the public wear down, a kind of democratic line as opposed to the prescribed path of the authorities. And if you think about the way that we acquire our expertise, our proficiencies, our daily habits, our relationships, our relationship to, say, a new mobile phone. So this is Varlam Shalamov talking about beating a path through the virgin snow. How do we do it? At first, one person walks ahead, sweating, swearing, barely moving his feet, and then five or six people follow shoulder to shoulder along the narrow, wavering track. And eventually, if we persist with the new, it becomes a desire line, it becomes a habit. But to kind of encapsulate thinking about habit as internal, habit as people, habit as place, I think this is a nice image to think about that. It's by Callum Colvin, and it's of the musician James Macmillan. And at first it looks like one of those slightly artless portraits, but in fact it's a photograph of a room. And the musician's ear is on the wall, part of his ear is on the chair, his face is on the table. And I think this says something, or it's certainly a good analogy for thinking about how our identities are distributed. They're not just internal, they're not just external. They kind of take over the rooms, they take over our nerves and our muscles, and habit is a very distributed process. So... What's going to happen? Something's going to come along. Something is going to come along and disrupt our small world. So let's begin to think about change, the beginning of Act 2. And the end of the world doesn't need to be the end of the world. It doesn't need to be a cancer diagnosis. At this time of year, a lot of our kids may be going to university. Mine is just finishing. But those kind of ordinary, everyday life transitions, that's where, uh, as President Bartlett says in the, the West Wing, the most costly disruptions always happen when something we took for granted stops working, when some element of our life suddenly changes, and then we realise quite how important that was. And it's like I said, it doesn't need to be the stuff of movies. I was thinking about the, the effort involved in, say, beginning a new book, when you have to commit to the characters and remember their names, that kind of awful effortful stage of beginning. Getting used to a new phone, so the thing that should be the transparent medium of communication becomes in itself problematic until you begin to beat the paths and it becomes an automatic process again. Changing job, changing location. So the people, places and things are their absence. This is the kind of change that I've been interested in thinking about. 
So, back to beginning. So, we've begun the first moves of Act 2, and there's a sociology of liminality, so limin meaning nothing more than a threshold. So, the sociology of crossing the threshold from one state to another. And there's been a, a resurgence of interest in this field in, in sociology, and a lot of the work that was done uh, back at the beginning of the last century was around rites of passage. And one of the, the basic insights they have, and I think it's a lovely insight, is that if you're moving from, say, adolescence to adulthood, from singleness to marriage, that there needs to be a transitional stage, what they call the anti-structuring phase, the destructive phase, where the existing habits, the existing networks, in some way need to be destroyed before the next phase can be built. So, and it's from there that we get this idea that when we're in transition, we're no longer and we're not yet. And that's a very kind of frothy, uh, anxiety-provoking place to be. That's quite a, it's like Keatsy's definition of negative capability, to be in the middle of doubt and uncertainty and not grasp after certainty. That's a very difficult place for us to stay, which is one of the reasons I think we avoid change. If you want to be psychobiological about it, we can call that process allostasis. Uh, it, as opposed to homeostasis, where we're working hard to stay the same, allostasis is where we're trying to get to a new set point, to reach a new normal. Uh, but again, I like to think in movies, and I think it's, it's act two. It's that transition between w one normal and the next period of relative stability. And it's, it's quite a difficult place to be. There's a, a lovely book by Tiffany Stern about uh, rehearsal. And she makes the point that particularly in the early days uh, of a play, it was still a work in progress, literally, in that it was a transaction between the audience and the performer and the writer. So in those early days, my, my friend Maureen called me up when she'd just moved house, moved in a new lodger, moved in a cat, phoned me up in tears and said, I feel like I'm playing house, because there was no precedent uh, to the life that she was living. There was no gravity, there was no weight. So what do we do in those times of transition? Again, I think the sociologists have something to say, and one of my gripes with my field of psychology is there's so much wisdom just lying around it, you know, one department over, that it doesn't draw on. And uh, Bourdieu writes really beautifully about what he calls habitus, pre-existing ways of thinking, feeling and doing that we can draw on when we're going through transition. So if anybody who's had kids uh, going from adolescent into early adulthood, that kind of identity shopping, that they're doing. Are they going to be an emo, a goth, uh, an indie kid? You know, they're shopping for these prêt a porter identities, which Bourdieu calls habitus. And there's a really lovely example of this from uh, Linda Melito, uh, a mafia wife, talking about the way the gangsters learn to be gangsters, watching The Godfather. So he watched it like 6,000 times. He could not pull himself away from the TV. He could not stop watching that stupid movie. A dozen times he told me, this movie is fantastic. The guys who came to the house were all acting like Godfather actors, kissing and hugging. So there's a strange reciprocity between what we want to be and what's available out there. And this is something that uh, marketers know and cult people know as well. That uh, Again, the way the sociologists talk about it is that when we're in that anti-structuring liminal phase, we're more porous. We're more open because the, the boundaries between our own identity and other people are much blurrier until we've got into a new fixed state. And so this is just a, from a lovely article in The Observer about cults pointing out the fact that the common factor in people who got involved in cultic groups, uh, cultic groups are midlife crisis, going to college, graduating, college, loss of a loved one, death or divorce. So in transition, we're, we're kind of shopping for ways to be and we become that much more vulnerable to the available narrative. Which is all to say that change is uncomfortable. Uh, the psychologists Rudolf and Damasio have a, a nice hypothesis, nice way of looking at subjectivity that uh, they call as the homeostasis machine. That at the core of subjectivity and feelings is a, a dynamic of resistance to variance. We work very hard to stay the same. And when we're forced into change, it is uh, phenomenologically to be inside it is quite uncomfortable. And it is so because the three faculties, which, by the way, I think are nicely illustrated, the three faculties of heart, mind and will, Tin Man, Straw Man and Cowardly Lion, are, they're, they're all up. They're all in some way overactivated. We're cognitively preoccupied. We're having to think for the first time in a long time. We're, 
our emotions are always going to be heightened. It might be excitement, it might be anxiety, or, or, or it could be anticipatory fatigue, the sort of all the change you're going to have to take on. And we're going to be physiologically aroused. Our HPA axis, our hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis, our autonomic nervous system, the, bit, the bits of us that cope with, uh, with novelty are going to be on, and we're going to feel it. And according to uh, some psychological theorists, we need to feel it because it's precisely that arousal that drives us to find a solution to our problems. We will stay uncomfortably aroused so that we work to reduce that discomfort, which is the kind of biological drive to get back to normal. Because as creatures, we're much more comfortable uh, to be creatures of habit, where we're not having to be quite so preoccupied for so long. Because we do know from the psychoneuroimmunology literature, if that kind of arousal goes on for too long, that's when we begin to break. That's when we get the ulcers. That's when we get the depression. That's, that's when uh, things get difficult. A couple of last thoughts. My friend Abby has just come back from India. He's trying to start a new life in the UK. My daughter Vicky has just finished university and is beginning to think about what she's going to do next. And you can see them, they're both curled up inside the end of Act 1. They don't quite want to begin this journey because they know it's going to be tiring and difficult and dangerous and they don't know what they're in for. And Abby very beautifully calls it the starting problem. He says, I'm having a starting problem. And, uh, but, you know, they're no different from you and me that when faced by that kind of deliberate or inadvertent change, we do. Avoidance is a very reasonable response. But also, a phrase that's really struck with me and a couple of the reviewers have picked up on is from my friend Lenny, who talks about character sclerosis, where even though change is demanded of us, we stop responding to the new. We just churn out the same old response, even when something new is called for. Or, as Nancy Sinatra sang it, we keep saying when we ought to be changing. Uh, to end on a slightly less downbeat note, George Eliot is very, very good on these kind of moments, and a lot of her literature can be read as thinking about how the liminal times are also times of opportunity and the decisions we make at those times. We're not just setting up habits, we're also in some way forming our character. She says that the decisions we make in these transitional times, they're uh, what she calls a record deeper than the skin. We're beginning to form the person who will meet change in the future. We're beginning to uh, form our character. Or as Larkin puts it, the circumstance we cause in time gives rise to us. So... Uh, to end by narcissistically quoting myself, we, we will become what we repeatedly do, so let's be careful what we start, trying to capture some of that wisdom from them. And certainly where I got to in my thinking about it was that there needs to be a balance. Habit is great. The vast underbelly of automaticity that we all rely on every day is really great. We don't need to think things through from the beginning. But there needs to be a balance between that and time and space for deliberation. Uh, and thinking about what's in charge. Is it old habit running the show or is it uh, something a bit more deliberate? But also thinking about, you know, there's a balance between ossification of churning out the same old response, but also we don't want to be at the other end. I work in both the NHS and academia, and systems that are in a permanent state of flux can never get the work done. And everybody who's in them is tired and grumpy. It, you know, they're difficult places to be. So we need to find a balance between kind of permanent revolution and permanent ossification. And I think, uh, most of all, we need, uh, particularly in those times of change, we need some time to deliberate. We need some, some time out. <laughs>